health emergencies. When I spoke with uh, Professor Kretua this morning, first time having a conversation with her, been admiring what she's doing. I admire the call that they made on monkeypox, the way they look at a global perspective. The first thing that came to mind was novel approach. How do we move on to creating partnership, collaborating, and ensuring that we take a global perspective? And so today, she will be asking the same question to us here and presenting ways by which they're thinking about that. But it will be about us as a whole saying, if we're creating earlier warning frameworks, how do we move towards that using the center that she has created? So one great thing that we have going for us today, ladies and gentlemen, is that we have her here present. The kingmaker is here, or the kingmaker is here. So we'll be able to listen and share ideas with her. Um, while we wait for, I don't know if you can share now. Can you, can you see, please? So um, at this point, I will then ask you to welcome our August guest. It's a very unique opportunity to have her with us. Please, let's welcome Professor Marisa Kretua with, as she presents her work. Oh, even better, yeah. Maybe. You can just put it here. Yes. I can put you here. Is this, uh, does this work? Is yeah. every, can everyone hear me yeah. all right now? Okay, fabulous. Um, what I'm going to try to do, of course, wearing a dress, this is always the challenge. Hopefully this doesn't bounce. If, Perfect. If I bounce around too much, let me know. I'll try to not move too much. Yeah, I'll do it here. Thank you. Um, so as I was saying, you know, my, my question was, are you sure? I'm not a researcher. I mean, at least I'm not primarily doing research. As Jude said, I, I do have a, a status appointment at the Dalalana School of Public Health. I'm an epidemiologist. I, I, I was in research. I was at Blue Dot. I was at uh, the Institute of Population and Public Health. But right now, I'm a full-time government employee at the CIHR. So I'm not doing traditional research. Uh, I am no, not designing or managing surveillance or early warning systems, nor uh, is CIHR a data custodian. So we're not feeding in to the early warning system uh, uh, systems and uh, some of the modeling that 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 um, that folks in this room are doing. So that was my response. I'm like, you do know that what I'm talking about is the research funding ecosystem and the research system as a whole. So um, and I was assured that that was, in fact, the perspective that uh, that you were uh, looking to get today. So what I what I can talk about today, and I hope um, and I hope will result in a, a, a good discussion afterwards. I'm hoping to speak for about 30 minutes about what is this center um, that uh, that I'm uh, leading now on behalf of CIHR, uh, what we do, where we're at currently, because it's it's new. It's only was set up in January of 2022. Um, and then some of the strategic considerations and challenges that we're grappling with as we move forward, which I hope I can get some input and insights from you. So I think what, what I would love to hear is um, how do we ensure that the research system is able to support the type of work that you do so that the uh, mathematical mathematics for public health program and, and, and work such as that can really contribute to Canada's preparedness posture and help inform decisions that need to be made in emergency contexts, whether it's emergencies around emerging infectious diseases, or whether it's climate change emergencies, or emergencies related to our health system, or other. Um, so that's what I'm hoping to get out of today, and hopefully that aligns with your expectations. So I'll jump in. So the CIHR Center for Research on Pandemic Preparedness and Health Emergencies, which because of the never ending name, I'm just going to refer to it as the center, uh, or else most of my presentation is just going to be 
uh, uh, saying that name over and over. Um, the center is new as of, as I mentioned, January 2022. But CHR has been funding research around pandemics and emergencies for a while. And, and in fact, after the uh, 2014 uh, Ebola, uh, the West African Ebola outbreak, uh, CHR set up a emerging health threats fund, and it's $5 million, um, which has been set up to mitigate the harms and impacts of identified uh, emerging health threats. That fund is, is under the management of, of the center that I lead now. Um, and it has been activated numerous times. So uh, it, it was first set up and activated at, after the West Africa Ebola um, outbreak in 2014. But then again, unfortunately, in 2018, it was necessary to activate it. It's been used uh, for domestically for the Alberta wildfires. It was activated for Zika in 2016. And of course, that was where CHR started in terms of um, uh, mobilizing resources uh, when COVID um, appeared on the scene. So, and I apologize in advance, I have a couple of very busy slides that I'm going to be pulling up uh, back to back. I don't have to read them all. The, the reason that I pulled up or I included this slide in the presentation was not to go through the full timeline um, of COVID, but it was just to get a little bit of a sense uh, or give you a bit of a sense of what what CHR is doing when I talk about the research ecosystem. Um, not everybody knows that that really that encompasses more than just pushing money out the door, right? So people think about CHR and and SHRC and NSERC and IDRC and they think you know th th what's visible are those funding opportunities, right? You see that, but in the background there's there's a lot of other work that is going on to help support that research ecosystem. So for example, uh, in January of 2020, CHR had already you know there was this this novel virus, there was this threat that was appearing that um, the world was taking notice of. This was before it was declared a public health emergency of international concern and before it was a pandemic. Um, in January 2020, CHR had already contributed funds to support a WHO and um, a global collaboration on, um, I always forget what GLOBIDAR stands for, global collaboration on infectious disease uh, preparedness, and I'm sure I have that wrong, um, to meet and actually develop a roadmap trying to identify priorities. So that was already happening back in January. WHO declared the public health emergency of an international concern um, at the end of that month. CHR and other research funders at that point joined, uh, signed a joint data sharing agreement. So already at the global stage, there was negotiation and conversation saying, hey, this is happening, this is important. We need to very quickly and openly share results of research that we are funding. And so that was actually a joint data sharing agreement that happened already back in January uh, of 2020. Um, the uh, CHR then actually launched the first open COVID-19 uh, rapid research response in February. And uh, that was actually the first open research call globally. So that was, um, that was quite uh, a, a, an accomplishment. And then money or the results of the competition were announced um, at the end of that month. And then the government of Canada started flowing money for research after that in March. And it wasn't until March 11th that uh, COVID was declared uh, a pandemic. So all of this was happening in the background before we really sort of got into the nuts and bolts of um, uh, the regular funding calls that, that most of you probably have seen. Um, a couple of other points that I did wanna make, it was, it was in spring 2021 that uh, the government of Canada uh, uh, approved funding to set up the center, uh, which I'm talking about today. And then it was January 14th, 2022, that the center was uh, formally launched. And I, I, I warned you there would be a second really busy slide and here it is. So this, again, you are not meant to read it. It's really just to show uh, a little bit of a funding opportunity timeline. So from, from the moment that uh, CHR started activating COVID related funds in, in, in fe February of 2020, it was almost monthly that funding opportunities were being launched um, across the four pillars of, um, uh, of, of CHR's mandate. So all the way from uh, biomedical and preclinical, all the way to sort of population and public health. And at the end of the day, um, 
you know, what, I, what I'm trying to um, uh, paint a picture of in these, in these slides is just, you know, what, what feeds into that sort of research ecosystem? What was CIHR doing even without the center being a thing? You know, the center, a lot of what I've just presented to you, this was before the center was created. Um, what is that work that the center is now sort of trying to uh, take on on behalf of, of CIHR? So, um, and, and what were some of those wins? I, you know, I also just wanna say that I'm going to be saying, um, I'm going to be explaining why the need for the center uh, was there and and why CHR without uh, a, a, a built for purpose mechanism such as the center had some challenges. But before I go on to that, I really do want to point out some of the successes and actually the, the huge bulk of work that happened um, in those months um, when when COVID first came on the scene. And so up from from February 2020 up until when I uh, took on this position in in July of this year. CIHR, or sorry, July of 2022, CIHR had actually flowed almost half a billion dollars of federal money. So this was new money that was identified by the federal government to activate the research uh, mechanisms to address the threat of COVID. Almost half a billion dollars of investments through 40 individual competitions that were launched and over 965 grants were funded. Um, and the list of grants here is just a, a small selection of, of the 960, uh, sorry, of the 40 different uh, competitions. It's really just to give you a flavor of the vast range of topic areas that we funded. Everything from clinical trials, um, the solidarity trials scale up here, um, therapeutics, uh, testing, clinical research around um, vaccination and therapeutics, um, uh, the uh, health system work in the health system and in institutions such as the work on long term care um, pandemic preparedness work with indigenous communities uh, focusing um, research focusing on children youth and families social science and health research around uh, increasing vaccine confidence etc so a wide range so you can imagine not just the expertise that had to be pulled on to design and, and um, uh, these competitions, but the peer review committees that had to be pulled together quickly. You know, we had to we had to find people who could peer review these funding opportunities, and um, in in you know a matter of weeks they were given, um, and then come up with uh, 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 the, the the grants that we actually ended up funding. So. I'm presenting this all to say it was a massive amount of work. There were opportunity costs for the organization. Um, uh, in, in that, for instance, um, we had to cancel uh, the, uh, the spring open competition. There were things that had to be uh, scaled back in order to be able to deliver on this. But it was also a really interesting opportunity for lessons learned. So through this process, we identified, for instance, what I just said, you know, wow, we need, we need peer review committees across the gamut. We need to know who the experts are. We need to know quickly. We, didn't, we found out that we didn't have rapid mechanisms to identify priorities. What should we be funding? You know, where we're, I, I just showed you a slide, we were, we were launching funding opportunities monthly, but somebody had to come up with the decision of what that focus area was. What's the priority now? What's the gap? What's the needed? So identifying priorities, gaps, um, uh, how to do this in a transparent way, how to ensure that people aren't being left out. So um, uh, we, we early on, we found that there were folks who were not being represented in the grants that we were funding that were on the most rapid cycle. Uh, a large proportion of the, the folks that were, were missing were women researchers. Uh, we found women researchers were, were, were less likely to, uh, because of competing priorities and having a large proportion of the caregiving burden, uh, which is what we, we heard from them, uh, were not necessarily able to make some of the, the initial rapid um, timelines that we were putting forth. So all of those learnings were, were happening in the background as this uh, response was, was um, being undertaken. So at the end of the day, um, you, you know, the, the, the big takeaway was that we needed, CIHR needed, the Government of Canada needed a um, fit for purpose mechanism to, um, to, to uh, deliver and support and coordinate 
uh, research on pandemic preparedness and health emergencies. So this announcement, this is still up on the Government of Canada website. It was in January 14th, 2022, um, that Minister Duclos made the announcement that the center was gonna be up and running. So, uh, so, so what does the center do? Um, uh, or at least perhaps I'll, I'll back, uh, take a step back. What's the mandate of the center? So the mandate of the center is uh, very broad. So one of my first jobs coming into this position is to scope it a bit, um, because as you can see here, oh, maybe you can't because there's a little, uh, let me see if I can close that so that you can read. Let's hope I'm not gonna, sorry. I wanted to cl close the thing that, I, that was blocking your ability to read it and I don't know what I just closed. Um, but as she's pulling that up, and hopefully I haven't um, messed things up, the, uh, the, the, the scope of the center or the mandate of the center is to ensure an emergency ready health re research system that can uh, prioritize, fund, uh, here we go. It's, it's, it's written here and, and, and I was ad-libbing. So um, that can support, coordinate and mobilize an emergency ready health research system that contributes meaningfully to timely, equitable and effective decision making. So it's a huge mandate. It cuts, uh, it includes funding research, so advancing knowledge, uh, funding training and capacity building and knowledge mobilization. And it cuts across uh, prevention, preparedness, response and recovery. Um, and of course, uh, within that, there are some key um, science policy um, principles and, and, and cross-cutting uh, platforms that we need to incorporate and figure out how to do that well, such as equity, diversity, inclusion, uh, Indigenous self-determination. We have to take a global health lens. You can't do pandemic preparedness research without taking a global health lens. Um, Stephen Hoffman mentioned in his, um, in his presentation that Canada is quite lucky that we have IDRC, which, uh, which is a, a, a very important facilitator of us being able to do meaningful global health research. Um, and what you can't see under there is that um, also taking advantage of the innovation sector. How do we, in preparedness, um, uh, pandemic preparedness and health emergency work, how do we leverage the innovation sector? How do we take life, uh, life cycle approaches? Um, uh, yes, and so those, those were the sort of critical pieces that are um, hidden, I think, that you can't see. So, oops, and now, now it's not letting me go down, hold on, Let's see if this works, oh. I just want to go to the next page, I pressed this and it didn't do anything. You, you had it work. Okay, perfect. Um, so the, this slide, the purpose of the slide is really just to highlight that um, where the center is a bit unique at CIHR is the coordination role. So um, funding research, funding training and capacity building, that's what CIHR does. Everyone knows that. That's the bread and butter. What is a little bit unique that the center um, does, which we have to figure out the best mechanisms, is that coordination piece. Um, coordinating the research and capacity building um, within the health research system re related to emergency uh, response. And so the center obviously is one player. The reason why this is so critical is, is we have the Tri-Council, uh, who all do very important uh, um, uh, aspects of work. We have the, um, uh, the universities. We have other players like Public Health Agency of Canada that Stephen was just uh, presenting on behalf of. There are the provinces and territories that fund uh, research. There's provincial health research funding agencies, NGOs, um, et cetera. And so all of this needs to be coordinated so that the response to emergencies is cohesive, non-duplicative, um, and, uh, and complementary. I'm not gonna, just so you know, there is a working definition that we have. So believe it or not, that was even something we had to come up with. There wasn't a working definition for a, a health emergency in this um, context. So what are, so that's what 
the mandate of, of the new center is. Um, but you know, how, how are we supposed to do that? So as I mentioned, we're, we're situated within, we are within CIHR and CIHR has a federal mandate, so that helps. Um, we have very close ties to the, uh, the, the, the Tri-Council and, and IDRC and, and, and NRC and, and, and other um, uh, important uh, research funders in, in Canada, but also globally uh, as a member of, as part of CIHR, it also lets me sit at tables for international funders um, and so that we can do that coordination piece. Um, in terms of money, uh, which is, of course, very important, not everything, but it's very important. Uh, the center has an ongoing uh, funding, base funding of $15 million uh, a year of, of grants and awards. I also have some operational funding. Um, but that base funding, the, the, the key thing, and that doesn't include the $5 million uh, Emerging Health Threats Fund, which um, is also managed by the center. The, the, the unique and um, interesting thing about this base funding is unlike most research funding that came into the ecosystem as a result of COVID-19. This is ongoing. So this is now meant to set up a permanent fixture in the health research uh, landscape of the center. And then uh, the, the little asterisk is to, is to highlight that what I have learned, even just in the short time I've been in this position, is when an actual emergency is happening, such as COVID, such as MPOX, uh, additional funds flow to address those specific emergencies. So one big question is, okay, that 15 million then, which is ongoing, that gives me a, a very nice opportunity to look long-term because that funding isn't going anywhere. So that allows me, unlike a lot of the COVID funding, which was for you know one year, for 18 months, for blah, 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 uh, that allows me and my team and, and CIHR to say, okay, we could fund something for 10 years. We could fund something for 20 years. We could, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's gonna happen, but meaning we can really take that long-term vision of the research uh, ecosystem and what's needed from a capacity perspective. So what will the center actually uh, do? This slide is really just to sort of say, hey, you know, I'm looking forward, but we've, we've also actually been doing some stuff as well. Um, so uh, because the center just started in, in, in January, I had some people say, you know, when I started in the role in July, I had a few people ask me, so, you know, it's been up since January, what's been happening? What have you done, right? Uh, and, and so I do want to point out, we've been doing stuff, uh, but one of the challenges, which many of you probably know, is setting up something brand new. There's, there's some work that has to go into uh, getting your feet under you. So, um, and this is actually a little out of date. So we now have seven full-time staff. So, you know, hiring, we've been hiring. Uh, we have 12 part-time staff. Um, we had to set up uh, and, la and launch our governance structure. So I have a steering committee. I'll, I'll, I'll say something about that in a, in a, in a subsequent slide because um, we need to be accountable. We need to be transparent. So what are those governance structures? Um, my team and I have been working to set those up. We've had to get operational processes in place. There were rapid funding mechanisms, but they were when, when CIHR was responding to COVID, those rapid funding calls, everything else had stopped, right? So. CHR went into business co continuity mode, which is all the governments of Canada uh, branches, basically only essential services uh, uh, were to continue. And then all those people who were no longer doing what they usually do were pro brought in to the COVID response, right? Um, so part of my, uh, my team having to develop these operational processes is that we need to be able to run in the background when CHR is doing its normal stuff, right? So we need those processes specifically for the center to move forward. Um, and, and also we've been setting up partnerships. So I mentioned IDRC, uh, you know, we have to set up partnership agreements with IDRC and the public health agency and, and, and lots of that kind of work. And throughout all that, um, we've at least as of, um, actually it was November, 2022, we, we had continued to push COVID funding out the door. So about $26 million in my time, we've been pushing out the door focused on COVID, long COVID, MPOX, um, the health human resource crisis. There's been lots of stuff happening in the background. Um, so I did want to mention my steering committee because, you know, I think, um, as I mentioned, one of the one of the interesting aspects about the center is that coordination piece. And um, and and one of the mechanisms that the center is is, is going to do that work is through um, having a steering committee that represents not everybody, it's not ideal yet. Uh, we don't have um, all the voices probably that we need yet, uh, but it's a good start. 
and we have representation from across uh, federal and uh, provincial and municipal government on the steering committee to provide uh, both the perspective of what's needed, but also to be able to help with identifying priorities from a governmental perspective and mobilizing the research, right? So the steering committee is also able to say, oh, hey, you know, we can go back to Health Canada and public health agency and blah, 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 and ensure that what CIHR is funding and doing can, can, can actually reach the right ears and, and get on, on, uh, in front of the right people. Um, and then at, at the international level, that's still being developed, what the international strategy is, but we're already a member of the, the GLOPIDAR, which, uh, which I mentioned, which is a um, collaboration of, uh, of international research funders focused on prepared infectious disease preparedness. Um, we uh, sit at the World Health Organization R&D uh, Blueprint um, Committee. Uh, we partner with IDRC, um, and uh, Essence is another uh, a network that, uh, that we belong to. So, um, and I think this is maybe the second last that sort of that, uh, before I get into some of the challenges that I'd like to um, maybe uh, spark a bit of a conversation with you guys on. But um, one of the other things that, that, that my team and I have been working with, um, with partners on is, you know, where should we be? investing to have the biggest bang uh, for our buck given the limited resources we have and what needs to happen you know what are those proposed sort of investment streams and strategies we should be thinking about um, as i mentioned we have the ability to fund research and, and the mandate to fund research uh, but there's two different types of research so largely where we've been uh, cihr has been with respect to COVID, has been in that responsive research right so responding to the emergency whether it was COVID, whether it was post-COVID condition, whether it was MPOX. But I'd like to shift us a little bit more on that proactive research, which, which involves identifying gaps and priorities. So, you know, we've been hearing a lot about vaccine confidence. How do we bolster that? How do we, how do we create behavior change in the population? Behavioral sciences, you know, all of that kind of work. Um, we are in a health human resource crisis, right? How do we fund research around uh, prioritization and planning within the health human resource um, setting. Lots of different topic areas. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, want to invest in training and capacity building. So what are those, what are those skill sets? You know, and, a, and an obvious one that I heard about a lot was, of course, the infectious disease modeling. We need more modelers, right? This is, you know, where, what are those uh, 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 skill sets, competencies that we need to, 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 to train up uh, people and and the capacity building isn't just on the on on of course the um, the trainees it's also on you know receptor capacity um, ensuring that um, uh, that we've got the platforms and the partnerships in place to to support a pipeline of highly trained uh, folks um, and there's lots of mechanisms that we can leverage that already exist within CHR such as chairs and embedded and experiential training opportunities. Uh, and, and platforms, but also um, some uh, some things that might be novel, right? Experimenting a little bit more with uh, embedded and experiential training, right? We we have some, but we I think we can expand on that. And I think in this context we need to expand on that. Uh, but then also academic industry. How do we leverage? Ind There's a lot of innovation happening in industry. Um, how do we leverage that to help train up um, uh, our our uh, our people? And then, of course, there's all these science policy considerations that um, that we will be uh, supporting and investing in, such as um, uh, equity, ethics uh, around emergencies, et cetera. So, so this is where I'm. What time is it? I just want to make sure I'm on. That's okay. Uh, I'll try to go through. This is actually the. Uh, where I think we sort of get into some of the um, interesting quandaries and so i'll i'll. I'll Hopefully we can um, come back to some of these items that I'm going to be talking about in, in the discussion, but some of the strategic considerations that we're uh, starting to ponder at the at the Center is can be broken up into two. So first of all, there's what we have to be able to do in the emergency itself. Right. So uh, and I sort of box that's sort of where we've been sitting uh, up until now in the sort of response. Um, uh, uh, position. And so 
when it's an emergency, we have to be able to, we have to have mechanisms in place to rapidly identify research priorities. That was really challenging to sort of say what, you know, we've got $10 million, we have to get it out the door in seven days, what do we focus on, right? Um, we have to have mechanisms in place to ensure context appropriate evidence is available to support emergency response. And this actually relates, I was glad that I think one of the questions to Stephen Hoffman's talk around the community base. So it's not just that, the, 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 the context appropriate is everything from, you know, what are policymakers and decision makers and, uh, and, and, and practitioners actually needing that the context of the evidence gap, but also the context from an implementation science perspective of, you know, it's one thing to generate research, but how do we apply it? And is it gonna work in that context for that group of people in this particular setting? Um, so, so having mechanisms that we can ensure that the, that the research is, is, um, is translatable and actionable and, and reflects the context where it's needed to be applied. Um, ensure funded research generates timely, rigor rigorous, and unbiased results. So that speaks to the fact of, you know, doing rapid uh, peer review, that's challenging. How do we, you know, how do we make sure that, that, that we're asking people to develop a, a, a proposal in two weeks and then we have one week to do peer review? How do we make sure that at the end of it, we're actually funding really high quality um, uh, uh, and, and fairly evaluated work, right? Um, so that's sort of an internal issue, uh, less, less probably what we'll talk uh, with you, but just so that you're aware of that. Um, ensure equity and inclusivity across the research enterprise. As I mentioned, there were people who were not getting funded. The COVID funding, tons of COVID funding coming out the door, and there were folks that uh, we weren't reaching. Uh, so how do, we, how do we ensure that we uh, are, are really tapped in to the research community in an equitable way and in an inclusive way? Uh, the translation and mobilization of knowledge. We all know about that, that's, that's challenging, but it's not just on the researchers to figure that out. The research ecosystem needs to also have mechanisms in place to say, you know, you do your job, you're really good at that, um, and then we're gonna help make sure that um, this, this, this moves and, and, uh, um, and gets used um, uh, quickly. And then of course, the knowledge sharing and coordination, which um, is, is critical and has, there's been a tremendous amount of effort at the grassroots level among researchers to self-organize and self-mobilize and create these uh, research networks and um, uh, across the country, and that's phenomenal. Um, and how can we not lose that and, and, and support that going forward? So that's what we have to be able to do during emergencies. In between emergencies, what, what, what does the center do? Well, in between emergencies, ensuring that we have an emergency ready health research system is gonna rely on proactive ongoing investments to build research capacity, right? So as I was saying, we can do that sort of long-term visioning of what are those gaps we have to fill. Um, advancing methodologies, we could fund really interesting sort of novel methodological work. You know, one example was, and this is uh, more, I think what Stephen was referring to when in that conversation at the end of his talk, how do we do community-based and community-led research in emergency contexts, right? Um, you know, the spoiler alert is you kind of have to have those relationships and methodologies set up. You can't build the ship while you're, while you're uh, sailing it. Um, and so that really needs to be invested in a priori. Um, supporting collaborative research teams and networks that build on interdisciplinary insights. So we kept hearing about interdisciplinarity. We kept hearing about how the teams that did the best during COVID were teams that already were used to working together in an interdisciplinary way. You couldn't force interdisciplinarity in the middle of COVID. Those relationships and those uh, that experience working across disciplines had to already be in place. Um, and we need to fund more of that. Supporting uh, systems research. So, you know, these, these, these things like COVID, things like MPOX, things like climate change, these aren't linear, simple challenges. These are complex, interdependent challenges that, that involves uh, uh, systems research, complexity science approaches. How do we do that? Um, leveraging strengths and opportunities of Canada's innovation sector, I mentioned. Um, and then, you know, ensuring that we don't lose the value of investments and learnings that happen during emergencies, in between emergencies. So really building it in as a learning system, right? So when, when something happens uh, and we all, as we've done, we, we work together, we, we uh, react, we, 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 
we, we get so many insights and learnings and what we don't want to do is lose that and every time there's an emergency we rebuild relearn um, and start from scratch so we have to build in that learning system approach i promise i think i only have two more slides so because um, i do want to save time for conversation so this is just one example um, this is not meant to be i'm not i i, I just want to make the disclaimer this is not my commitment that we are going to be doing this but uh, one of the things that's coming up is um uh, that is that is really interesting and that has been successful in other jurisdictions, for example, in the UK. Uh, the, the UK actually did very well during many of you probably uh, are collaborators with folks there and, and, and know this already, but the UK did quite well um, in uh, activating research teams quickly and generating evidence and mobilizing that evidence quickly during COVID. And one of the reasons for that, there's few, but one of the reasons is that they had adopted since H1N1, they had adopted um, hibernated models where they continued to invest in teams and networks, uh, but at a lower level, right? So these, these teams and networks were, were kept alive with the lights on. And then those teams and networks were able to be quickly activated, scaled, and pivot to COVID-19. Um, so that's something to learn from, and that uh, I know I've been looking at very closely. And one of the one of the uh, the, the values of networks that that are kept in the system um, and continue to be funded is that they're if we can provide long-term support for multi-institutional and interdisciplinary research, so it connects up institutions and 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 that interdisciplinarity we were talking about, um, it can establish and support a base of expertise and infrastructure, including the training, that the fact that it's an opportunity to train and mentor folks uh, uh, to have those um, expertise, and that can pivot uh, when new challenges arise. Um, it, it can build and sustain those partnerships, because this is the other thing we learned, of course, those partnerships are critical during an emergency to be able to just pick up the phone, as opposed to having to figure out who you have to call. Um, and, and be able to quickly work together. And then, of course, promote responsive, coordinated, and comprehensive knowledge generation and sharing uh, and application. And, and these are not endorsements of anything. These are just a bunch of the networks that we ended up funding uh, at CIHR. Um, these are not all, uh, but some of the networks that, um, that COVID funding has gone to uh, support and have all uh, played roles, of course, in the uh, COVID response. However, a challenge if you say you're going to invest in networks is how do you determine those networks, how do you support those networks. Um, this this slide is is just to highlight that um, you know I had the team do this analysis uh, to look at you know this is just for one competition, a big one, but one competition we did uh, related to COVID-19 to see where were the uh, the, the, the principal investigators located across the country, and as you can see you know there first of all there's a huge concentration in, in Ontario followed by British Columbia Quebec and Alberta as you would expect but I think of, of greater concern is that there's a lot of places in the country obviously that don't have institutions and um, universities that could support the kind of work that we were funding and so if we are going to create a network if, if we are going to say that let's say the center one of our strategies is to invest in networks which is uh, you know possible um, how do we ensure that those networks truly are pan-canadian and that we're actually representing the experience in the uh, uh, in the emergency context of the population living in Canada and not just the the, the big urban centers. Um, I'm not going to go into this beyond saying, you know, there, we have quite a few mechanisms also to ensure that relevance piece. So this is sort of for another talk, perhaps, but um, uh, uh, you know. We, we, we need to ensure that when we're identifying priorities, networks, investments, that it's, uh, that it's relevant to the actual um, health and, and, and political and social context of the, uh, of the emergency. We have some mechanisms to do that, but we also need to be able to mobilize that research. We need to be able to communicate clearly, um, coherently, consistently. Um, and, and so another area that we're looking at uh, investing in is sort of around science communication and, and, and some of that work, but that's something else. Um, and this is the, my last slide. So this is, so, and I'm just leaving you with it. It's, it's really funny that Stephen uh, mentioned the UN Research Roadmap um, uh, in his talk, and, and this is taken directly, and I, 
I do want to say I am sourcing it. So the fact that it's blocked doesn't mean that I'm not uh, giving the source of where I got this from. Uh, the UN Research Roadmap is, um, uh, is available online and this is directly cut and pasted from it because I thought it was really interesting that you know we undertook that work back in 2020 with the UN. And it's just to say that this isn't this isn't new. This isn't what the center is doing that's so remarkable or innovative. This is these strategies to ensure that we can respond and recover better is something that all governments and all funding agencies are struggling with. Um, I just have the, uh, the, the, the honor and the um, privilege of being able to spend my time full time <laughs> working on it because it's really interesting and, uh, uh, and thinking about some of these uh, challenges, uh, including knowledge mobilization, science of science, how to set up rapid learning systems. Um, and then the piece that I, is a whole other talk, and luckily Stephen talked a lot about it, is the data infrastructure piece, which obviously is critical underpinning everything. Um, so I'm just going to stop there, and uh, thank you very much for the time. Creating networks and maintaining them to ensure that when something happens like COVID, we don't start forming them but we have something ready to go. Thank you. Thank Great you. Visit. Please, we now have room for questions. If you're online, please, you can type your question or put it in your hand and put those in the room. Yes, Fusha. Thank you so much for this talk. I, I, I want to point out something about the, the francophones networks mm. and all the challenges in building that. And during COVID, we, we saw it clearly that in, in Quebec and mainly in the Francophone universities, we don't have network, we don't have, we, we really need support to, 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 uh, for capacity building because we have a lot of challenges, even hiring students, uh, mm -hmm. uh, paying them very well because many of our students come from, from uh, basically uh, North Africa or the Francophone country in Africa. So they, they already have a lot of challenges. So we, we want to hear from, from you about like, is there any, any future for, 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 for this? Uh, like, uh... No, thank you for that. I mean, I thank you for that question. And, and, and absolutely we have to, I mean, that's, we, we have to do that better. And, I, and that was, I, you know, what I was getting to when, you know, I was saying that we have to understand how to do this with equ centering equity, right? How do we do this centering equity? Because as we know, and when I, you know, when I mentioned near the beginning of the, of the presentation, actually, I, I probably didn't emphasize it enough. It's the words are there, but I didn't emphasize it enough it, uh, that, of course, that's one of the things that's the hardest. If you don't have the mechanisms in place, to ensure equitable response, as I mentioned, inclusive response, mm -hmm. uh, making sure we have representation, maybe both from the research community, but then also like, what are the priorities put on that? You know, prioritization of, of research has to be, has to consider the whole of um, the, you know, people living in Canada and the, the global experience. Um, so it's, it's beyond just who's getting funded, it's the questions that we're asking and the types of, um, uh, research itself is it community based are we hearing from community are we sharing back with the community how the knowledge mobilization is happening you know all of that has to we have to build but we have to build those mechanisms starting now you can't it's very hard to build those mechanisms in the middle of the emergency right because people are just trying to do things quickly and that's what and then and then equity is one of the things that gets sacrificed um, which we have seen right and um, yeah so that's one of those in between times focal areas that we're really committed to um, trying to understand how we can improve that. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much. Equity is at the center. Very, very important. Um, we have room for questions. Um, any questions online? As we move towards asking your questions online, mm -hmm. I love how you mentioned how uh, women, were, when you look at the demography of people that applied for funding, there was a particular group and you identify women. And as you move forward to building this center, you may realize that the network that exists that are strong enough to be able to do some of the work that you already have, the capacity was already built over the years over and over because of certain privileges. Again, you don't blame those networks for existing because of privileges. But the question here is, how do we make it inclusive in a way that 
people that have been left out can have their voice in otherwise we'll not have constant feedback from everyone within our country yeah yeah no and it's such a fantastic question and i don't I, you know i don't yet have the answers i mean i think i think what uh I think one of one of the things that we're really trying to take an active uh, role in is looking at the um, the training pipeline, right? Because one of so you know one of there's the challenge in kind of getting people in the door, but even once you get people in the door, you you need mentors and um, and professors and faculty who can understand how to ensure that that pipeline is successful right because you know sure you can say i'm gonna i'm gonna have a a phd uh you know scholarship for phds from different communities but but you need to set people up for success like just getting them in the door is only half the battle so so it's, it's really a, an ecosystem you know i keep i'm overusing the word ecosystem but it really is an ecosystem pipeline approach um, that we have to take and um, and how to best do that is is going to be complicated but committed to doing it so yeah thank you committed thank you so much <laughs> I'm worried that you're recording are you recording me? yes <laughs> no I'm, I'm 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 happy to yeah. <laughs> I'd actually like to pick up on that point yeah, you made yeah. just made about the pipeline yeah. which is that we need to get people in the door we need to give them the mentorship to succeed and then we need to give them somewhere to go. Yes. And we need to make sure that there are positions of, of some kind, whether in academia or industry or in government, for people with this training to continue to make use of that training so that they're there to be called on when we need them. Absolutely. Yeah, here, here. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. And, 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 you know, some of the, um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I fully agree, and it's a it, again it's a it's a full sort of system ecosystem strategy that has to be put in place, and of course the center is, you know, pandemic preparedness and health emergencies. You know, I I I'm in that niche, but but I think what I find exciting is because it's something new, and again I'm being recorded, so I, but because it's because it's something new, and CITR hasn't had something like the center, right? CITR has the institutes, which are phenomenal. The center is something new because it's inside of government. Um, and I mean, even the name, it's not the Institute of Pandemic Preparedness, it's the center. So whether it's legitimate or not, I'm taking that as license to experiment and try things out um, and, and say, you know, let's try this and, and just pilot it and then see how things go um, to try to see uh, yeah, what works, what works, and what doesn't, and and then and sorry, this is the last thing I'm going to say on this, but um, just from a, a positioning perspective, the center is within CHR, and there's different portfolios, and I don't expect people to understand the org chart of CHR, which is complicated, but the center falls under uh, a the portfolio of learning health systems within CHR, so and and that's literal, you know, it's it's really this idea of um, innovating, trying, evaluating going back and and uh, uh, and regrouping and so um, so there's opportunity and I'm putting that as an invitation out to all of you there's opportunity for us to try things within the pandemic preparedness space at CHR through the center that typically maybe haven't um, been done at CHR another question from Barry online um, Barry, will you mind so we have a question from Barry online Barry will you mind turning on your camera and ask your question Oh, just ask you without any camera at all. <laughs> sure. uh, thanks for that terrific talk. I had one uh, question. So this topic, emergency preparedness, is, is very much a multidisciplinary um, field. So can you explain a bit more how you involve um, Shuriken and CERC? So yeah. to ensure that you're reaching both those researchers that are more in, in the habit of uh, working with those funding agencies and also that their proposals are um, uh, assessed and evaluated well in, in the way that they are used to, um, um, to be evaluated. And that, that applies even more when, when there are proposals that are interdisciplinary. Yes, yes. Um, great, thank you for that question, great question. And, um, you know the, the full the full strategy obviously is still being developed as I said the Center is new but um, but that's definitely. Uh, 
an area we're working towards. Uh, for instance, SHRC and NSERC are part of the steering committee. So they, they are um, at my steering committee that helps uh, not just uh, identify priorities, but understand how we should move forward on, um, uh, on, on acting on those priorities. And, and there, are, um, there are precedents at CIHR. So we do work very well with NSERC and, and SHRC, and there are precedents for tri-council uh, initiatives, specifically around, um, particularly around training. And that's something that I would love to explore. Um, you know, if we're thinking about creating training opportunities, capacity building opportunities, whether they're uh, platforms like, you know, I don't know if folks are familiar with the old STIR model at CIHR, um, whether platforms such as that, I think they need to have, they have to be cross-disciplinary. And, and the way that makes sense to do that is, is to see if we can um, do something in collaboration with, with SHRC and NSERC. Um, so that, that's actually kind of the easy part, to be honest, probably, uh, bringing NSERC and SHRC to the table because they're interested in this as well. As you pointed out really, really nicely, one of the challenges is when, when the rubber hits the road and you start actually uh, doing, some, for instance, peer review um, and, things, uh, and things like that, the actual sort of um, uh, uh, designing of the funding opportunity and then, and then doing the peer review to ensure that that intercross disciplinarity is really um, uh, given the credit that it needs and that you have the right expertise around the table to uh, properly do that evaluation. And that's, uh, that's an area where we still have a lot of learnings to do, to be honest, that's, that's, we haven't solved that problem yet, but uh, we're working on it. We still have room for, we have Professor Kretoy here and thank you for being patient and generous with your knowledge. Oh. So we can ask as many questions as possible. <laughs> but being part of the mathematics for public health that have always been left out when it comes to informing policies, I wanted to find out, do you find any role or any room for mathematicians or artificial intelligence experts across the country working with this center to ensure that we create this level that you're trying to create? Do I see any room? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I am at CIHR. So of course, when you say room to work with, you, you sort of have to depend. Yeah, yeah. cuz as a funder, <laughs> as a funder, I can't work with you on, you know, you have to yeah, that's that that would be a conflict of interest. But uh um but absolutely and I'm just, you know, wearing my other hat in a, uh, I, I was at the Institute of Population and Public Health and, and probably some of you have heard of it, but I, I was one of the team that uh, put together the funding opportunity for the AI for public health uh, competition, right? So it be, with, it, with the recognition that this is an underutilized area applied to public health and how can we make sure that public health is, is using it, right? So yeah, so so at a personal level, absolutely, I recognize that uh, at a institutional level of what that might look like in terms of building capacity and supporting it, you know, I think I'd love to, I'd love your ideas, you know, what, what's needed, right, to create that, that expertise and, and, the, and, and the appropriate networking um, across the country to create these programs, right? So send ideas. We have that your way. Um, <laughs> the for public health just made, and I must thank you. Thank you. For, the for public health in the sense that what AI for public health has been doing, building capacity is great, and my public health is following. Julie has a question here. First of all, thank you very much for the very informative talk. And one of the slides really fascinated me is about you know the comparison between the, the quick responses and in between mm. periods, which mm -hmm. is very interesting. And we do see a lot of quick uh, events going about uh, urgent emergencies going on, and their events funded throughout the year. Yeah. Um, it's actually uh, though one of the topic that who rises in this in this workshop is that you know um, public health a lot of the research is actually a long term uh, investment like yes. the early warning systems so there it, it's very important to respond to specific challenges but uh, if there i mean a way that uh, the agency can um, that, that CIHR can you know build up a long term investment strict, strategic plan to deal with this you know, uh, building up capacity so that um, in the long run, uh, we yeah. can have long-term support. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and this is, you know, 
so a lot of those slides were sort of saying you know what we've been doing but i think you know one of the things i i i, I I wanted to highlight was that that, this, that strategy is being developed. Like that's what we're doing right now. We're trying to figure out, you know, great, we're set up, great, we have our steering committees, great, we have this funding, but now what's what's the right strategy to ensure that, you know, if you if you go back to that first slide, the mandate is to ensure that we have an emergency ready health research system, right? And and so um, understanding that what we have to do is, you know the foot's on the on the on the pedal for the gas and then the foot's off and the foot and that's been one of the I, I know that that has been one of the challenges with public health you know there's this investment and then the investment stops and dries up and then investment and and part of I, I'm hoping what the center can do as I mentioned because we have that permanent long-term funding it's not enough to support public health writ large but perhaps in our little niche of pandemic preparedness we we can put in place some of those sort of long-term really strategic and thoughtful plans to ensure that exactly that sort of level of funding is enough to keep a, 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 a real uh, a preparedness posture for Canada and, all, and, and, and specific research areas, specific programs that maybe we can't fund it at COVID levels, but it's funded at a, at a, at a level that allows it to continue to exist, continue to train people, continue to maintain those partnerships and those relationships and that infrastructure and that concentration of expertise, and then it can be ramped as needed, right? Ramped, uh, scaled, uh, pivot to the new, you know, emergency du jour, right? Um, so yeah, that, that's the plan, but I don't know exactly yet what that looks like. <laughs> uh. Uh, thank you so much thank you. for being generous with us. Oh, thank you for the and, invitation. And thank you for mentioning that you play a big role in explaining that AI for Public Health, also Rosala and the team has been doing an amazing job right. in the country and Namaste for Public Health has been doing an amazing job. I'm glad that you're open here. to receiving a file from us with a list of things we can do with your capacity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can trust me that you have that coming your way. Thank great, you. great, you thank you. Thank you, thank you. And, and once once again thank you thank you for the invitation it was my pleasure and uh i will remove the uh oh <laughs> thank you so much